Welcome to Barnesville Today's Year in Review. There were a few changes to our daily morning show in 2017. We updated our format from an hour-long show to a half an hour in an effort to streamline the information to you, our viewer. Sarah Mantle moved with her family across the country in late August, and I stepped up as host in September. Although we've been through some changes, our goal has always been to bring you all the news and information you need to keep you informed about what's going on right here in the town of Barnstable. In this year in review, we'll look back on the past year and share some of our favorite interviews and segments. We hope you will join us again next year. Channel 18 is committed to the town's mission statement to provide the best possible services consistent with our budget policy to respond to our needs, to the needs of our community and to openly involve all in protecting our unique character and quality of life. We will be back on January 3rd with all new shows. From all of us here at Channel 18, we wish you a happy new year. So Judy, you have a bunch of knitters here behind us that you have organized uh, to do some really great projects for the community. Tell me why you really wanted to start this knitting group to give back to the community. Um, a year ago, my mom died of um, dementia Alzheimer's. She was at the pavilion and I was retiring and I anticipated that my retirement would be taking care of her. Uh, much to my surprise, I found myself without a retirement plan, so I thought, well, what could I do to honor my mom because this would be mom time. So I um, grew up knitting with my mother, and so I started a knitting group in honor of her. And your first project was actually uh, very connected to your mother because you decided to give back to those at the pavilion. Tell me about what you guys, your first project, what you knitted for mem members of the p pavilion. We knitted um, shawls and lap blankets. Lap blankets because there are so many patients there in wheelchairs. And so it was at Christmas time and all of the ladies made shawls or lap blankets and we wrapped them individually in bags with tissue paper and bows and brought them over to the pavilion. And um, it was a great success because many of the residents that are there don't have visitors and don't have a Christmas gift. And um, they were able to first give those to those in need and then give any leftover to those who would most, most benefit from it. Isn't that wonderful? Did you hear a lot of feedback from residents who received the blankets? Oh, yeah, and it was, and from the people who were there to watch them get it. It was very touching. And they all remembered my mom, those who could, but the staff also remembered my mom. So it was, it was really nice. So nice. meaningful, yeah. so meaningful. Mm -hmm. and, and then you continued. You didn't stop there. You wanted to keep going. Mm -hmm. uh, you pick a new project every month. Tell me a little bit about the teddy bears that you guys have been making sweaters for and putting together. Well, um, one of our members, Derek, had brought in a teddy bear and he recommended that we do some teddy bears for um, the police department because other communities do that. So I went over to Barnstable Police and they said yes, they could benefit, they could use them. And uh, so our group, as an ongoing project, makes sweaters for the teddy bears. Well, when the library saw our teddy bears, they said, oh, we could sell those here. Would you donate some to us so that we could sell? Because a great portion of our funds to run the children's library, we have to raise ourselves. So they now have a teddy bear sale ongoing from the bears of so, which we make the sweaters. What a great uh, give, giving back because uh, the library, uh, this does not cost you to be no, here. Not at all. Uh, you're giving back to the library, mm -hmm. but at the same time making sure that children in distress at the Barnstable Police Department mm -hmm. that may interact with the police department have something comforting in, in that time of stress. And you guys continue, and each month you pick another project. What are some of the other projects you guys have chosen? Well, I chose the first project, and um, as a group we chose the over, the broad overriding project being the Bears. 
but each person every month to have ownership of this group because it really is about all of us. Each person chooses a project. In January we did hats and scarves for the RFK Center for Adolescents and um, we are now doing baby blankets for the baby center of which you can see this is only one week's donation. Um, April we're doing um, hats for Alzheimer's. The Alzheimer's family support system from the center from Brewster is having a big walk in Harwich in May. So we as a group are going to be participating in that walk, Knitting for a Cause walker, walkers, and we're knitting a hat and donating a hat for all the walkers. Wow, that is so amazing. You know, it must feel really good, at least uh, in grief, to be able to mm -hmm. put that energy into something really positive and to give back to the community. Uh, and not only that, but just to develop this community of people who gather every week. You guys mm -hmm. gather here at the Centerville Library every week. Mm -hmm. What do you most take away from this experience? Oh, that two things. One is this, that I look at the group every week and I see us all knitting the same thing for the same purpose. And it's all volunteer time for that. I also appreciate the camaraderie and support we each give each other. You know what? I never had the time to knit because I worked full time forever. And so now this gave me an opportunity to meet other people. And I said, let me try this. And I learned something. But we have a great connection. Yeah. Just um, connected. Everybody has a different expertise, and they're all so accepting. And, and we're doing this for a reason. Right. Which makes it more fun, I think, to have a reason to do it. It does. Just got some donated yarn that I'm recycling. Yeah. We were at Judy's one night meeting. Um, her husband came in, and it was at the time they had that awful tragedy at the high school. Yes. Yes. And with the two little kids, and he, he, he said to us, Bill Bears probably went to those two little kids. Yes. And with this finger, with this finger, there's so much unsettling going on in the world right now that it's really good to be able to. Yeah. And you need to know that we're doing something you positive on for our local this people, for the people we live with, yeah. that we're helping them too. It's a very good feeling. We just help each other along. And that's life. Okay. okay. I was unaware of that. Sure, Pat. It's never knitted before. No, I never knitted before. No. But I she's learning my, fast. I wouldn't call myself a <laughs> <laughs> This is the most welcoming group I've ever met. I'm a quilter. I don't know how to knit. And they are teaching me. Thank you so much for having us today Thanks. and uh, telling us all about Knitting for a Class. Yeah. We really appreciate it. So Chief Maruka, you know, it's springtime, everyone's wanting to get outside, uh, clean up their yards after the winter. A lot of times this includes some burning. So let's talk about how to do this safely and uh, make sure we have all the proper permits. Uh, what are some things that we need to know, first of all, about burning uh, this time of year? Well, in the, in the spring, Massachusetts allows homeowners to burn brush. Uh, from January 15th through May 1st. May 1st at 4 o'clock. It's all done. We have to stop. Uh, you need a permit issued by the fire department. Uh, they look like this. And um, they're easy to get. We don't charge for them. Uh, just stop by the fire station or you can go online to the West Barnstable Fire Department's website and you can get your permit that way as well. Why is it so important to have homeowners or individuals who are looking to burn some items, why is it so important that the fire department be aware and that they have that permit? Mainly because each day we have to make a decision as to whether or not it's appropriate to burn. And we make that decision based on safety, uh, dryness, wind, um, and other factors that, that you know, are based on, on how safe it is to burn that particular day, as well as air quality. So every morning we get a safety report from the state, we get an air quality report from DEP, and based on that information, each fire chief in the state makes a local decision as to whether or not we're going to allow burning on any particular day. Occasionally the state will shut burning down for us and say no burning for anybody, but most of the time it's a local decision we have to make. We do it at about 9.30, quarter to 10 in the morning, and so people with permits have to call in before they burn 
and get approval for that day. And this way we know who's burning, where they are, and if we have weather changes during the day, we can go out and shut the burning down if we need to. And we've had that happen every few years where we get a day that gets more dangerous than we thought it was going to be. And really, it's just all about safety. Um, of course, anything that any any reason you would shut it down is really just about safety. Yes. What about tips for people who have the permit? They have the proper permit now. Uh, they got the OK to go ahead <laughs> and burn. Any tips for making sure they don't have any incidents in well, in their yard or, or home? Don't get carried away. <laughs> I, yeah, that, that's it. I, I would say from between two and six times a year, we have to go out to extinguish a permit fire at somebody's home that has gotten too big, it's gotten out of control, it's moved into the woods, or on rare occasion, it's actually burned to the side of the house. Uh, so you want to avoid that. Um, keep it 75 feet away from buildings. Make sure that you have some water available, a hose, buckets, some way of dousing the fire, or at least cutting it back in size quickly if you need to. Uh, don't try and burn it all at once. Uh, start with a small pile and, and add things to it as the, as the day goes on. Burning's allowed from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., so you've got a fairly long period of time. Uh, you're not allowed to burn stumps and big logs. It, it, this is strictly for small brush branches and things, so you know, keep it simple is, is our advice. Uh, pick a place in your yard uh, where you're not too close to the brush and dry areas where, where it could spread to and watch for sparks to see if it's uh, the wind might be carrying sparks from your fire and dumping them in the woods. Uh, sometimes we've had them dump them on the roof and they light the leaves and the gutter on the house, so you want to watch out for problems like that. Um, so those are you talked a little bit about what you can and what you cannot burn. So we cannot burn, say, a large stump. What are things, are there any other items you want to make sure yeah. that individuals do not burn? You're not allowed to burn trash. You're not allowed to burn construction debris. Uh, you're not allowed to just burn leaves. Um, leaves are a problem, and, and that's a DEP rule. Um, so it's really, when we say brush, it's sticks. It's, it's things, you know, maybe three inches in diameter or smaller kinds of things. It's all that yard debris that comes down every winter and in these windstorms we've been having all spring that your yard is full with. That's the perfect thing for burning. Uh, so those are, those are kind of the rules on it. No gasoline to start the fires. That's, we've had problems with people using gasoline and they don't understand how explosive it is. Uh, don't, don't use any of that. Well, wonderful. Sounds like yeah. we're ready to go. Anything else you want us to be aware of about just, seasonal burning? Sure. Just be aware that spring is the traditional brush fire season in New England. Uh, unlike the West Coast and the South, uh, our big brush season is April, May, June here. It gets very dry, and when it gets dry, warm, and windy, Cape Cod has serious brush fires. Uh, make sure that, the, that your yard, uh, the woods don't come within 30 feet of your house. Uh, that you have lawn or some defensible space around your property. Uh, try and keep the five feet around the foundation of your house clear of piled up leaves and combustibles uh, so that sparks from a fire uh, don't ignite the side of the house. We've seen that where, where fire climbs up the house and it gets into the attic uh, very quickly. And uh, lastly, make sure that your, your house has its numbers on it so we can find you when you call us if there's a fire and that your driveway is kept nice and clear and wide and you got you know, overhanging branches that don't block our fire trucks uh, are, are things that we run into out here in West Barnstable. Right, because if you're in need of help, they need to be able to access your <laughs> home. We need to get there fast. And need to be able to find right. it clearly. It so can be tough out here finding houses sometimes. That's right, yeah. that's right, great. Thank you that's so good. much for all the wonderful advice. We really appreciate it. All right, our guest thank today, you. Yeah, great. Yeah. Our guest today, uh, Chief Joe Maruka for the West Barnstable Fire Department. Vietnam veterans were recognized for their service at the Barnstable Senior Center Wednesday, March 29th. The event was held on Vietnam Veterans Recognition Day. The gathering commemorates the anniversary of when the last American combat troops were withdrawn. During the emotional event, veterans had the chance to talk about their experiences in Vietnam. Many speakers thanked the Cape Cod Vet Center for the work that they do. 
Vietnam Veterans Day commemorates the sacrifices of Vietnam veterans and their families and is part of a national effort to recognize the men and women who were denied a proper welcome home upon returning home more than 40 years ago. Most states celebrate Welcome Home Vietnam Veterans Day on either March 29th or March 30th of each year. Though there is some debate, generally March 29th is viewed as a more appropriate date. On that day in 1973, the last combat troops were withdrawn from Vietnam, and the last prisoners of war held in North Vietnam arrived back on American soil. It is also the date that President Nixon chose for the first Vietnam Veterans Day in 1974. 42 states currently have created a Vietnam Veterans Day. According to Massachusetts general laws, as enacted in 1979, this might be surprising to folks, it surprised me, in 1979, March 29th was proclaimed Vietnam Veterans Day for the state of Massachusetts. I don't know if everyone knew that that's been around for that long. In 2008, the Secretary of Defense was authorized by law to conduct a commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the Vietnam War. The inaugural event occurred at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, commonly known as the Wall, in Washington, D.C. on Memorial Day in 2012. President Obama was a keynote speaker, and many of the most senior military and civilian leadership attended, but most importantly, thousands of Vietnam veterans and their families the true VIPs were there. That day, President Obama stated, and I quote, one of the most painful chapters in our history was Vietnam, most particularly how we treated our troops who served there. You were often blamed for a war you didn't start, when you should have been commended for serving your country with valor. You were sometimes blamed for misdeeds of a few, when the honorable service of the many should have been praised. You came home and sometimes were denigrated when you should have been celebrated. It was a national shame, a disgrace that should never have happened. And that's why today we resolved that it will not happen again. Thank you. All military families endure the hardship of separation uncertainty and fear, but the families of our Vietnam veterans also witnessed their loved ones returning home to a nation in turmoil. They watched as the vast majority received no formal recognition for their service or welcome home ceremonies hosted by their communities. These service members who had chosen to honor our nation's call were encouraged to travel home, not in uniform, but in their civilian clothes. Many were profoundly impacted by their experiences both overseas, as well as by the poor treatment upon returning home. Like veterans returning from today's battlefields, those who served in Vietnam came home with both physical and unseen injuries of war. Sadly, many of the unseen injuries suffered by our Vietnam veterans went undiagnosed and weren't understood by our medical community or our citizens, as they are now. Veterans were left to meet these challenges without the outpouring of assistance that's available today. However, too many fought in Vietnam never experienced that return home or the chance to marry or have children or grandchildren. Their future was cut short, their hopes and dreams along with it. And the families of those who didn't return, whose names are etched on the wall, experienced the painful loss of a loved one without the support of their nation. Some brief statistics. 58,307 names appear on the wall in Washington, D.C. Their average age, anybody know? 21. Close, a little bit older, 23.1. Many tens of thousands were disabled. Approximately 7,500 women, the majority of whom were nurses, served in Vietnam, eight of whom were killed in theater. And as of February 23rd this year, 1,615 are still considered missing in action, and their families await word of their fate. These facts provide us with some context and understanding of the true cost of war, which I don't need to tell you. It's not measured in dollars and cents, but in lives. Neighbors, friends, and family who come home with seen and unseen scars that need mending and extensive care, 
or do not come home at all. These facts also were best understood by those who served, and of course, families. Some continued to serve in uniform while many returned to civilian life, started families, and worked to contribute to their communities. Vietnam veterans mentored those that followed them in uniform and built the foundation of today's military. The impact they had on our current military and its leaders was significant. As World War II and the Korean War reached their 50th anniversary, our nation commemorated our warriors' service and sacrifice. And now, on behalf of the nation, we have the opportunity to do what should have been done 50 years ago. Welcome home our Vietnam veterans with honor and thank them and their families for their service and their sacrifice. As a note, the Department of Veteran Affairs and U.S. Census Bureau numbers indicate that those 7.2 million Vietnam veterans equal one in every 44 Americans. That's all men, women, and children. When you consider just those 65 years and older, the number becomes one in every eight Americans. Here's the one that stuns me. When you consider just men, 65 and older, anyone got a guess? One in every how many? One in every three is a Vietnam veteran in this country. Good guess. I ask that every Vietnam veteran among us please stand if you're able so we might recognize your service and sacrifice and finally begin the welcome home that you so richly deserve. Center is probably the best job that anyone could ever have. Um, I think I speak for us all in saying that. We are privileged because we get to listen to veterans' experiences. We get to be let in on stories that sometimes other people have been shut out of. We learn history and we get to share in people's lives. And we get to honor people who have worked to make our lives and the lives of our families better. We are allowed in when many others are shut out. And we get to hear veterans remember their buddies, laugh at funny memories, cry about the sad memories, and help work on the traumatic memories to lessen their negative impact as much as possible. But maybe the best part of our job is being able to build community. Whether that's community of veteran to veteran, or family member to family member, or on very special days like today, where we get to pull the entire community together to welcome home our veterans and give them acceptance and love and thanks. I don't know what else would be better than that. Welcome home, boys. Welcome home. Welcome home, boys. Welcome home. Welcome home, boys. Welcome home. And she watches the water roll on by. And she watches the water roll on by. Mama cried, welcome home, welcome home, boys. Welcome home. If you or a loved one is in need of services, the Cape Cod Vet Center is located at 474 West Main Street in Hyannis. The Barnstable Youth Commission hosted its third annual 7th grade youth summit Friday, March 17th. For the event, all 7th grade students at Barnstable Intermediate School were taken to Cape Cod Community College for a day-long program. The highlight of this year's program was former Boston Celtic Chris Heron, who shared his story of dealing with substance abuse. Students also got to interact with Barnstable High School students, learn about different activities offered at Barnstable High School, and learn about different nonprofit organizations in town that are here to help. Well, we found that a lot of the videos and wellness videos, I mean, we don't really have wellness in school. Um, so, and the voice that we had talking about drug prevention and stuff, substance abuse um, was the best word I could use was lame. Um, it was like kind of ineffective and we all kind of thought it was silly. So we really put this on. Um, and I wasn't on the Youth Commission when it, we put on our first one, but I'll, I'll never forget um, the quote was from uh, one of the commissioners, Liana. And she said, 
But no matter what we do, can this please not be boring? So we really focused on making it interactive, and um, I just saw Chris Heron, and he was awesome. He really geared it perfectly for children. Um, so it, we're really happy with how the event's shaping year to year and how um, we can kind of tailor for the youth since we can relate to the youth better than an adult could relate to the youth since it's closer. Um, we've been very fortunate in this year um, with us being able to have the Lyndon LaRusso sponsor. We were able to bring Chris Heron in and uh, there wasn't a dry eye in the house last night and today there's been a lot of shed tears um, and a lot of kids getting counseling right now. Um, we've got a lot of counselors here to deal with it and the, the teachers are being stepped up. He's asked the kids to reach out and the kids are actually reaching out. You know, I do this 250 times a year. I, I would do all kids if I could. Um, I believe it's uh, I believe it's necessary. It's needed. I think it's welcomed. I think kids understand it at their level. I think kids walk into assemblies like this and they think they're going to hear this horror story about drugs, and we're going to talk about heroin on Cape Cod and overdoses and all the people dying. But if we really want to understand this and address this, we gotta we gotta focus on the Adults beginning. Adults have to be involved in this when it comes to children. I think you know a lot of the kids keep secrets and. You know, they really don't know how to address it. Um, nor do I think they're emotionally well enough to address this issue. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a tough world and it's, a, and it's a horrible illness and professionals need to be involved when people are struggling with it. So, you know, if we, uh, early intervention is critical and I think when kids are this age and they hear of a friend who's struggling, they need to get a teacher or an adult involved. I think unfortunately kids don't have enough resources around them. There's not enough programs in place for these kids to um, really understand how to communicate about this. Uh, you know, hopefully one day my goal is that wellness will be a core class and our kids won't be afraid or challenged to communicate um, and express themselves with this issue. Um, but there's a lot of kids sitting in those assemblies who are afraid to tell anybody because they don't want anybody to get in trouble. Um, but you know, that's because for so long we treated this as, you know, very punitively, um, and we punished it and, and instead of treating it. And a lot of these kids look at this illness like, I'll be punished for it and not treated for it. Uh, I've already noticed a, a, a very profound impact that uh, Chris's message had on a number of the kids. I know myself, watching the story, uh, having familiarity already, I have I've gained a new appreciation for what he's been through and just how uh, how profound uh, his his story is and how powerful his message is. Uh, unbelievable. And uh, the fact that the kids were so captivated for that period of time uh, and as quiet as they were and as attentive as they were, I think by itself speaks volumes for, for how he uh, affected the kids that were sitting in that auditorium. I just think it's a wonderful opportunity for our students uh, to get out and hear messages like Chris's, to engage in the activities that are planned here, uh, to, to come away with uh, some learning uh, outside of academics that are just as meaningful and powerful uh, as they move forward as students and citizens. The town's blessed with a lot of great young people who are giving back at a young age. And, you know, if you have kids out there that you think might be interested in making a change in the town for the youth, they should step up and step forward. Um, you know, if, if you have questions or they have questions, they feel a little uncomfortable, come talk to me and we'll make sure that they get involved in some way, shape or form um, to help change the town.